Good morning and happy Father's Day to all the dads and granddads and uncles and all the rest of you guys too. This morning's scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through chapter 7, verse 1. The temple of the living God. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? That agreement has the temple of God with idols. For we are the temple of the living God. God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Am I ringing? <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer before we dive into God's word this morning. Father, we pray that you would help us to connect with your word this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that it has in our life, the power to change us and to transform us, to make us more like you. My prayer for myself and for everybody else here, God, is that we would be doers of the word. It's one thing to hear the word, to read the word. Um, it's another thing to put it into practice. And that's what we want to do, God. We want to take your words and live them out. And so help us today to um, understand what you're saying, what you're calling us to, and to be faithful to you and to live that out. Meet us where we're at, God. Each person here is probably at a different stage in their journey, and I pray that you would speak to each of our hearts today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Several years ago, I remember when I was a kid, I set out for my first attempt at being in a rowboat. Anybody remember their first experience with a rowboat? I was with another person, a friend of mine, and we were trying to row the boat together. And all we kind of managed to do was go in circles. <laughs> we, we, we didn't get into any kind of a rhythm. I was on one side of the boat kind of doing my thing. He was on the other side of the boat kind of doing his thing. And we didn't make a very good team. We really didn't know what we were doing. We, we had never done this before. And it really just got us nowhere. We went nowhere. In today's text, Paul is going to be calling believers to proper relationships as they live lives on mission. He's going to use the imagery of a yoke, a farm implement. It's used to join two animals together. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, his overall message in these verses today that we're going to be looking at is that we need to be careful with the level of relationship with we, that we have with those outside the faith. We need to form proper partnerships as we live out this ministry of reconciliation. If we remember back to chapter 5, we were called ambassadors and we were told to, to do this ministry of reconciliation. That, that's the mission that God has called us to. And if we don't form proper relationships, we may find ourselves, like me in that rowboat, going in circles, not really accomplishing the task and accomplishing the mission that God has called us to. 
Now remember, Paul has been pouring his heart out to the Corinthian believers. He's been telling them that he's demonstrated his love and his commitment to them. He's sacrificed, he suffered, he struggled for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the Corinthians. In chapter 6, verse 11, that Dean, my co-kid, taught on last week. <laughs> I just wanted to work that in. Sorry. <laughs> verse 11 in, in, in chapter 6, this is what Paul says. He says, our mouth has, has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. In the original language here, it means our heart is enlarged. Paul reveals the depth of his love and his care, and he shares deep emotion in those verses that are prior to what we're looking at today. And the Corinthians, in return, were restrained towards Paul. In verse 12, he states, You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. And then again in, in the next verse, verse 13, he, 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 he pleads with them, Now in like exchange, I speak to you as children, open wide to us also. Paul wants them to reciprocate. He wants them to open their hearts. But instead, they were making life difficult for him, as we know from the context of what's happening here. And his, his credibility is on the line. There are people thinking he was a swindler. There were people thinking he wasn't really an apostle. And he's trying to connect and come back together with them. And, and, and not only are they making life difficult um, and withholding their love towards Paul... But it appears they were eagerly entering into deep relationships with unbelievers. They stiff-armed Paul, who wanted to partner with them in, for the sake of this ministry of reconciliation. But then they would lock arms with those who could damage their faith and their walk with God. And Paul does not mince words in this passage. He calls them out on their behavior. And so this morning what I want to do is walk through this text that Carol just read for us and, and look at what Paul is calling the believers in Corinth to do, that they need to be partnering properly so they can best function in this ministry of reconciliation. So we'll begin in verse 14 right away, right out of the gate. He says, do not be unequally yoked or in the New American Standard, bound, okay? Uh, apparently, the Christians in Corinth were entering into strategic partnerships and relationships with people that didn't share their faith, their Christian faith. Scholars are mixed on exactly what was going on. It's quite possible that some of the Corinthians were still going to the pagan temple, maybe you know, being involved in the pagan festivals and meals and the practices, they were aligning themselves with idolatry. And this alignment was impacting their faith. Some believe that they were even making their best, most intimate friends with people who didn't know Jesus. And so they were joining together, in a sense, with people who shared different allegiances they shared different values. And probably there were some entering into formal relationships, contractual type relationships through business or marriage with people who were not believers. And what Paul says is to, is to not be yoked or bound together with unbelievers. The yoke was a piece of equipment that bound two animals together, typically for like plowing, or there was other work that they would be used for. But he, he said that, that they should not, using that imagery, they should not be bound together with an unbeliever. Paul was probably alluding to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, where we read, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey. In other words, don't yoke an ox and a donkey together. Now, there's a couple things in regards to that. The ox would have been considered a clean animal to the Jews. 
A donkey was not. So it would be wrong, it would go against what God had called them to do, to put an unclean thing and a clean thing together, okay? But beyond that, one is bigger and stronger. They would have worked at different paces. It would have made it impossible to work in harmony because they couldn't pull in a straight line. It would have just been problematic. It made no rational sense to yoke two animals that were so different. And Paul takes this command out of Deuteronomy and brings it to the New Testament and makes a spiritual point with it. He tells the Corinthian believers that they should not form close, intimate, formal uh, connections or contractual type relationships to unbelievers. Like two oxen pull better together than an ox and a donkey, so two believers will tend to pull better in the ministry that God has given them if they are matched up properly. Now, we need to bring some clarity to this because this, these verses um, have been misused and misapplied many times. Um, it's important to know that Paul is not prohibiting Christians from having relationships with unbelievers. We need to understand that clearly. As a matter of fact, it's interesting when you, when you start looking at um, when there is like a prohibition relationally, we, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We studied that uh, in the last year as we went through 1 Corinthians. But in chapter 5, verse 9 to 11, remember we had the immoral brother that was involved in an immoral sexual relationship in the church. And they were kind of celebrating it. Look at us. We're free. We've got grace. We can do whatever. And, and, and Paul called them out. And he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or the swindlers or with idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. But actually... I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So Paul's not making a statement that we need to just stay away from people that don't share our faith. Matter of fact, he's harder on the body of Christ and says if we're going to practice avoiding somebody it would be for the purpose of reconciling them back to the Father, to pull them out of their sinful behavior. So Paul's prohibition was not about unbelievers in that passage, but really about immoral believers. He was more concerned about the discipline of those in the body, those that lived in open disobedience. Unbelievers need Jesus, and Christians the body of Christ, we are the ones that God has called us to that message, that message of reconciliation that he's been talking about. He he called us to come close to people that are far from God. We can't remove ourselves from the world. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying. He's praying to the Father, and he prays this. He says, I have given them your word, And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus basically establishes this principle for the followers of Jesus that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. He wants the Father to keep them from the evil one. He's praying for their protection as they're in the world, that they wouldn't become of the world. Now remember, he's called us to a ministry of of reconciliation, and that means there's going to be times that we're going to find ourselves in an environment that will be challenging for our faith. But he's not calling us to cut off relationships with unbelievers. Instead, he's calling us to make sure that our most 
intimate relationships, formal kinds of relationships are with fellow believers. Why? Is it because we're so superior or better? Absolutely not. But sometimes we can subtly take that message. And sometimes I'm afraid we communicate that to a lost and broken world that we think we're better. That, that, that's not what it's about. It has nothing to do with worth or value. It has to do with this ministry of reconciliation and the need to partner with like-minded people. See, the reality is, is that believers and unbelievers will often have totally different goals, different values, different worldviews, and different allegiances. We need to join together with people that are pulling in the same direction. It's a mistake to hitch ourselves to someone who doesn't share our faith, our beliefs, our convictions when we need to pull in the same direction. This passage often gets applied to marriage. You've heard it. I've used it that way in teaching youth um, or business partnerships or a contractual relationship. But I think it can also apply to those friends in our life that we are most intimate with, those friends that we share our burdens with and our problems and we're seeking advice and wise counsel. We are just laid open in front of them because we need to make sure that we are staying focused on Christ and moving in the right direction. And it's a friend who would share our values and our worldview that will help us on that journey. I've often said, especially in youth ministry, our relationships will make us or break us. And when I was a kid, my best friend, I remember his name was Brett Rickard. I thank God for Brett. When I met Brett, I met Brett in seventh grade. And Brett was always one step ahead of me spiritually. I always felt like I was just kind of following behind. And I grew and I was challenged he challenged me to follow Christ more closely. I had other friends, and I did things with other people. I, I didn't, like, just cut anybody else off. But Brett was my best friend. He's the guy that knew me inside and out. He knew my struggles. He knew my weaknesses. He knew what made me tick. But he also knew that I wanted to live for Jesus and that he wanted to live for Jesus. And we could do it side by side in, in this intimate friendship relationship. And um, that was so very important. At the end of the day, my deepest connection was with Brett and then some other kids in my youth group. And we helped each other grow in our faith. We helped each other become uh, more obedient to Jesus. And it was there that I invested most of my I guess, I guess my personal time. <laughs> and the cool thing was, I can, there's no time that I can ever remember of going to Brett and being in a pickle or being in a jam or uh, needing advice where he told me to do something that was wrong or would put me in a position that was wrong. There was safety in that. And we pushed each other. And in the end, we both ended up in full-time ministry. And I think that friendship was so pivotal in that, for me at least. I don't know what I brought to him, but he brought a lot to me. We were moving in the same direction. We wanted to honor God in all we did. If a relationship that you are a part of requires you to pull in the same direction, it matters. It matters. So we need to realize that Paul is not calling us, though, to cut off ties from unbelievers. He's calling us to just be careful as we live out this Christian faith. Now next, in verses 14 to 16, Paul begins to lay out uh, these contrasts to make his point, to drive his point home. He presents five rhetorical questions. He asks about what these things have in common. He says, what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ and Belial, which is the Old Testament name for Satan? 
What do we have in common, a believer and an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols from the pagan temples? See, the point isn't necessarily value. The point is compatibility and alignment. As a matter of fact, going back to what I talked about at the beginning as to what was happening in the church of Corinth, if the Corinthians were still struggling with alignments to the pagan temples, <laughs> this makes a lot of sense when he references Christ and Belial and, and uh, the temple of God and idols. See, they were involved in relationships that were damaging their, wo- their walk with Christ. These relationships were pulling them towards sin, not godliness. Now remember, Paul still has in mind the fact that they are stiff-arming him and partnering with unbelievers on various levels. The odds of conflict and struggle will arise because worldviews are different. What we need as believers in those most essential relationships is to have partnership, to have fellowship, to have harmony, commonality and agreement as we pull together for the ministry of reconciliation that's what we need i remember years ago when i was a youth pastor in the state of idaho one of my volunteers was a gal she had kids in the youth group and i remember she she really wanted to talk to the kids about her own life and her own testimony. She was a a kid that grew up in youth group, was taught the ways to live. When it came to this passage, she understood that it was important to marry a believer. But she compromised that, and she ended up marrying somebody who was not a believer. Now, they're very much in love. I don't know if he's come to Christ yet, but at that time, he had not, not trusted Christ. They're still married. Um, But she wanted to talk to the kids about how complicated that made things, even though she loved him deeply. It had nothing to do with that. But she wanted to talk to them about, hey, you guys are coming up, you're dating. I want to let you know about some of the the difficulty that it brings with raising kids and finances and life decisions. And I think our young people really listened to that because she just was speaking from the heart and from experience. And so I said it then, and I'll say it again. I would, I would, anybody, any young person that's not married here, I would challenge you when you're thinking about that person that you would marry, even in dating, because really the dating is the purpose. It's to be looking for a spouse. Date believers. Date people that are moving in the same direction. And certainly when you get married, marry somebody that's moving in the same direction. It's huge. Now, Paul, now I want to make this clear too. Paul is also not saying that if you're married to an unbeliever or you have a business partnership with an unbeliever, you should just break that off. It's clear in 1 Corinthians, he calls believers to stay married to uh, their unbelieving spouse. See, if we misapply these verses, there can be a lot of damage that happens relationally in the church. It can be a mess. So we need to handle this stuff properly. And what I want to do is is I, I want to just talk about some ways that I think are ways in which we can respond to the world around us. If we're living on mission, if we're going to walk with God, and we're going to be obedient to the call that he's given every one of us as believers, which is to make disciples who make disciples, that means we're going to be living in the world but not being part of it. So how do we navigate that? I think there's three ways that I've often seen Christians or sometimes whole churches uh, interact with the world. I want to talk about those and talk about what I think is the best posture. First thing I've seen, we can imitate or accommodate the world. Some Christians just try to blend in and call nothing a sin. They just adapt to the culture around them. They accommodate the culture. We see this a lot in the modern church in America. Some churches are erasing sin in order to accommodate culture. 
In order to win some for Jesus, they try to please the world. This is not a good approach. We must stand for biblical truth. To ignore sin and dismiss sin is sinful in itself. And, and really, I don't think it's very loving. If the message of the gospel is true, it's not very loving to shortcut it and leave things out or erase certain things. The loving thing is to speak truth in love, in grace, in humility. And so to just imitate or accommodate, I don't think is a, a good approach for the Christian or for the church. Second thing I've seen, we can isolate. We can just live in our Christian bubble. We just live in a, this little protectionist life that we have, and everything we do is Christian and is done with only Christian people. And, and, and if that's the case, we're misapplying these verses. That's one of the things they say is we got to really define this out because if what we pull out of these verses is I just need to go stick my head in the sand and wait for Jesus to come, we're off base. We're misapplying these verses. How do we live out the task Jesus has called us to if we isolate and we don't engage or talk with people that don't know Christ? And I will say this, over my years of doing ministry and being around all kinds of different folks, what I've often seen when it comes to isolation, it usually leads to arrogance self-righteousness, and legalism, and judgmentalism. And it creates a world that is completely disconnected from the mission field. Isolation is, is not what God is. He, he's, I don't, I'm not going to take you out of the world. You're in the world. You can't isolate. Just don't be of the world. Don't act like the world. Live differently. We live in a world that's broken and lost and is desperate for hope and meaning and love. And we have been sent, not to the church, although the church is important. We need the church. It's a huge part of us uh, living our mission out effectively. But we haven't been sent to the church. We've been sent to the world. Isolation is not the answer. And just as uh, when we imitate, it's sinful, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's just as disobedient to isolate. And it's not very loving. There's people that are lost and desperately need a Savior, and we've got the... It's like if you had the cure to cancer and you said, oh, that's mine. I'm going to just... I'm gonna just going to hole up in here until, so, I don't know, something happens, but I'm not going to share that cure. That's what isolation does. If you had the cure to cancer, you'd be going, oh, let me, I got the cure. Let me tell you about it. Let me, here it is. You don't have to die of cancer, right? And so isolation is, is not the answer. Now, again, I want to qualify all these things. There are times when we need to pull away maybe from an unbelieving environment because of our own weakness. Maybe you're a new believer and you, 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 you've been saved out of alcoholism and going right back and hanging out at the bar with all your friends that are drinking might not be the best place to be. You know, there are some things that maybe we need out of our own protection for health and spiritual development for a season. We pull back and we get healthy. I, that's huge and important. But if those old friends are impacting you more than you're impacting them, <laughs> we need to pay attention. There may be a day when you're stronger and you can handle being around the old crowd, but for now, you just need to get healthy. But in the normal everyday living that we do, I think it's best if we go right back to that context that we got saved out of, if we can handle it. To take the message to those people that we already know, and they know us. And if we're in the world but not of the world, they're going to see a difference. They're going to see that God is doing something in our lives. 
And so that, that's not the answer, isolation. Third thing that I, I think is a, a perfect solution for this, what it means to be in the world but not of the world, is we can insulate. This is being in the world but not of the world. Electrical wires need to be insulated. They go from a power source to something that needs to receive power. So they put a rubber, like, I guess, covering over the wire to protect it from, number one, leaking out its own energy and electricity. Um, and, and it keeps it safe from water and other materials that could cause the wire to short out. But they also, this, this insulation around the wire protects humans from being electrocuted, right? And when a wire has the proper insulation, that cord can be strung across your living room, right? And you can touch it and you can move it and you can unplug it and it's because it's insulated. It's protecting you from that. And, and, and I think that's the, the picture here of being insulated, when a wire can pass through an environment safely, as we live in the world, we insulate by pursuing holiness, surrounding ourselves with godly people, and avoiding sinful temp temptations. So that's why in this passage, he's calling us to holiness, to purity. To, to, to not get involved in sinful behavior. And this idea of partnering with somebody, that person, it doesn't mean you don't have lots of friends that don't know Christ and you're connecting with them and loving them and showing Jesus to them. That, that's all important. But those best, most intimate friendships, those formal getting married, having a business with, or any other kind of contractual thing, Paul's saying, only do that with believers because you're going to be more effective. But you can't isolate. You've got to be in the world. And so I think this is the best posture. When we're insulated, we can come close to people that are far from God. We can love them. We can care for them. And to connect to people and yet not participate in sinful activity when I believe when people that are far from God begin to see the changes God has made in your life and you stand strong and true and your behavior begins to be different, even though you're with them, you don't behave the same way, they're going to start going, what happened to you? What changed you? Some of them might resent it. You might lose friendships over it. But let it be because they cast us out, not because... We said, well, I I'm, don't want to put my hands in that mess because I, I, I'm a Christian now. See, that's isolation. And Paul continues then um, with a quote, really, from Isaiah 52 in verses 16 to 18. He says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then in verse 7, or in chapter 7, we go to the next chapter, he continues this thought, but he breaks away from the Isaiah quote, and he says, Therefore... Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, we live lives separate from sin. We protect ourselves against defilement. We seek purity. That's insulation. Romans 12, 1 and 2 calls us to be transformed by the word of God. <laughs> rather than conforming to the world around us. When I, I got to have mental images as I think this stuff through. Think spacesuit. You know, when you see they show those videos of the astronauts going outside of the ship, they're in this suit. 
It's insulating them and making it possible for them to be in the environment but not be harmed by the environment. That's purity. That's proper partnership. Or think of an underwater diving equipment. Being able to go down and do things that we couldn't do without oxygen and different things like that. Or think of a submarine. See, that's, that is the picture. And what is around us is this, this desire to be holy, to honor God, to walk with God, to, to, to not just accommodate sin or hide from a sinful world, but to be able to step into and engage people in their lives where they are, but we do it shoulder to shoulder with men and women that will hold us accountable, that will walk with us, that will uh, you know, sharpen us. Like it says in Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. If we're doing those things, it will help insulate us as we step into an environment that could be harmful to our faith if we're not careful. We belong to God. He is our Father. We are his people. He lives inside of us. We are the living temple of God. Isn't that amazing? Seek him. Pursue purity. Follow his word. Be obedient to him. And make your only true allegiances to him. And I think there's two things that really motivate us to live like that. If we look in verse 1, it says that... uh, that we have these promises. Those promises, those are, that's love stuff. He dwells in us. He walks with us. He is our God. We are his people. He welcomes us. We are his sons and his daughters. That's a love relationship. It's a love for God that helps us live this kind of an insulated life. And also a fear of God. Not a cower in the corner fear, but a respect, a, 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 a reverence for who God is that moves us to honor him in our daily lives. The love for God and the fear of God is what will move us towards that. We are ambassadors of Christ. Our only allegiance really is to him. We need to remember that. This world is not our home. And we are citizens of heaven. We represent him to a lost and broken world. We can't imitate the world around us. We can't isolate from the world around us. We must live insulated lives and engage the culture. Be in the world, but not of the world. So Paul clearly calls the Corinthians to develop proper relationships and to pursue purity as they follow Jesus and obey the commands Jesus has given them. And to bring things full circle, this wasn't read in our original thing, but as I studied it through more, I realized we've got to go on to verse 2 very quickly. He he brings things full circle, chapter 7, verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. See, it brings it all the way back to what he was talking about in in the beginning of chapter 6, this plea. Open your hearts to us. Don't just... Partner with people that are going to drag you down in your faith, but partner with us as we move the kingdom forward. He says, make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. (laughs) Paul is, is returning to that plea. He's still chipping away at full reconciliation with the Corinthian believers. In some ways, this little insert of these of these verses that we looked at today doesn't feel like they just came out of left field, like it was a real sharp, you know, you just shoved it in another gear kind of thing. Like, where did that come from? But it really does fit contextually into what Paul is talking about, okay? He wants to see them have proper allegiances, And pure actions. He wants them to embrace him with an open heart. The partnership will be better. So Paul is saying, stop aligning with people and things that will not be 
that will not help you be successful as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Stop stiff-arming me and partner with me for the gospel. And today, what I want to call us to as a church is that we would not look to be isolated or accommodating or imitating, but rather that we as a church would live insulated lives, shoulder to shoulder with each other, pursuing purity, pursuing unity, and pursuing a lost and broken world with a life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Lord, I, I pray that you would um, help us. It's scary sometimes. We live in a dark world, in some dark places. And there are some things, God, that we do need to avoid to, to, to honor you with our lives. But, Lord, there are a lot of places that we, we need to reach into, not, not to partake, but to bring the gospel to people that don't know you. God, may we love so much that we just are compelled to, to take the gospel to people that are far from you. And that may mean rolling up our sleeves and getting a little dirty, reaching into the mud a little bit. Lives can get messy. But help us, God, to be motivated by the, our love for you and our, our reverence for you, God, to, to, to be willing to, to step out in faith and engage culture while at the same time engaging purity and right relationships and holiness so that we can live insulated lives in the culture. We need you. We cannot do this by ourselves, God. You are the one who empowers. You are the one who takes your word and, and takes the gospel and, and makes it effective. We're just called to be the seed spreaders. And sometimes that means we have to go to places that are different than what we're used to. But give us the courage. Give us the boldness. Protect us from the evil one. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.